guys, so we're jumping back right into uh, time period four. Uh, we have just about ended the World War I and we're getting into the Russian Revolution. So when we're looking at the history of Russia, where we have, of course, like Peter the First, and we have, um, you know, the modernization of Russia, but it doesn't really industrialize until after a lot of the other European countries in the 1890s. Um, that's especially going to happen with the creation of the Trans-Siberian Railroad that connects and is able to vastly increase the amount of shipping that um, the Russians can do. From 1904 to 1905, this is when J Japan is becoming a more imperialistic power. If you remember a couple of videos ago, we talked about how Japan wanted to become an empire just like the other European powers. And so they decided to attack a part of land that was contested by Russia. And to everybody's surprise, the Japanese end up winning the war. Um, the peace agreement is brokered by President, U.S. President Theodore, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And that is going to be a huge morale hit to the Russians. The Russians um, were actually not really doing super hot even before the war. And the fact that they lost this war is not a good sign for the current czar or king or emperor at the time. And that is Nicholas II, Anastasia's dad. And because of that, there is this thing called the Revolution of 1905 where basically the Marxists demanded that they wanted some reform and they are making a lot of a stir. And so he made this guy whose name is Father Gapon organize a conservative union to counterbalance the Marxists. However, when Gapon came and saw the craziness that was happening in St. Petersburg, he created a peaceful march to protest what was happening. And the troops that were sent by the Tsar, Nicholas II, fired upon the protesters who were peaceful and there were a lot of people who died and that day is called bloody sunday and that really pushed the liberals who are called the zemstos um not sure how that's pronounced and they demanded that they needed some reforms and they were the ruling like upper class the elite the rich and so nicholas ii gets pressured into signing this thing called the october manifesto which is basically where he says that he will um, enact certain reforms that are demanded of him. One of such being granting civil liberties, um, creating a constitution, and creating a constitutional ruling body, which is called the Duma. However, one year later, Nicholas II doesn't really like the Duma because it tries to tell him what to do, and so he ends up disbanding the Duma. Not that great when the people were not super pleased with you in the first place. Um, nothing much really happens until 1914 when against all of his advisors commands Nicholas II decides to join into World War I and it really just go down, goes downhill for him. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of Russians are being murdered in the war. There is starvation happening. Um, while Nicholas II is off trying to fight the war versus von Hindenburg, the German, his wife is left behind. And his wife is a... Um, well, first off, she was a German, originally, a German princess, and so nobody really likes her. And she has a son who has this disease called hemophilia, which is basically when your blood doesn't clot. And so the, the back then, you know, like, that's a really serious disease. Most people didn't really survive it. And the only way that she had figured out how to heal her son was trusting this magician whose name was Rasputin. Rasputin is a dirty, crazy, weird old man um, who claimed that he had these magical powers. Now, the reason that her son probably ended up kind of getting better is just because Rasputin made all the other doctors leave him alone and stopped poking and prodding him. Um, so the Empress only listens to Rasputin and that does not bode well for the people. They do not like Rasputin at all and they are rising against um, especially when we get to 1917, that's going to be a pivotal year. Um, there's this thing called the March Revolution, where there's so many food riots that the king end up, ends up having to come home. He ends up abdicating the throne in March of 1917. And they set up a provisionary government. And the provisionary government is, is run by this guy whose name is Kerensky. And Mar or in April of 1917 is when Lenin, who is leading all of the Marxists, 
um, manages to come back from exile and he demands certain things of the provisional government, like um, basically trying to create a socialist state. And that doesn't really pan out super well because in October, there's this thing called the October Revolution, which is when the government ended up failing. They stormed and seized the Winter Palace where Kerensky's government was housed. And then Lenin manages to gain control and set up a communist state with um, people like Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, who ends up being his successor um, as head of the uh, what eventually in 1922 becomes the USSR. In 1918, he creates this official um, Communist Party and he withdraws Russia from World War I and this thing called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And from 1918 to 1922, there's a huge turmoil in who is actually going to be able to run Russia. It's called the Russian Civil War and it's basically Lenin and the Marxists versus the Red Army versus the white army, which is the constitutionalists, the monarchs. Um, within this, Anastasia and her siblings and her parents, Nicholas II, they all get murdered. And that's not boding well for the monarchs at the time. And so the communists end up winning because their enemies can't get united enough to meet that force. And they end up winning. 1924, Lenin dies. and. He's kind of, his successors are kind of caught at a crossroads because on one hand you have Trotsky who was in charge of the army, but he's a Jew and it's an anti-Semitic, a pretty anti-Semitic community in Russia during this time. Um, and so there's a huge kind of like an upturn of like who's going to be able to rule and eventually Joseph Stalin manages to make it out, survive, and he has one of his accomplices murder Trotsky when he tries to escape and Stalin takes over from there and Stalin goes from through the 19 like late 1920s 1930s World War II into the 1950s with the Cold War and he's going to be super influential in Russian history as far as World War II and the Cold War at the beginning of the 1930s he has this five-year plan which basically starts up farm collectivization when you're combining farms all together in this equal society um, it's kind of works during the Great Depression, especially Russia gets to be the strongest industrial power in the world because the other industrial powers were so economically weakened like Great Britain and the United States because of the stock market crash. Um, and so Russia was really doing pretty well. And then Stalin becomes very, very paranoid and he has these purge trials in which he murders a lot of his enemies from 1936 to 1937. And the ones that he does not murder, he sends to the Gulag, which is like a prison work camp. Um, and that sort of leads right into World War II. And so my next video will be about the 20s and the 30s and the rise of Hitler and fascism. And then we'll get right into World War II.